you if you're seeing this video, it's either because I'm dead or because I've uploaded this video to whore out ad revenue money. But I'm Ghoul Harry, and welcome to the Games Yanks Can't Wank Halloween Special 2. <laughs> Sometimes it can be shitty when there's a game you really want You wait a really long time, it takes bloody years to come But what about those games that you just don't get to play? They were not released in the US, but places like the UK Many friends, but what does this have to do with this song? It's games that yanks can't wank. Apparently, these horror video games don't like being ripped off. And they're after me. I keep doing videos and they're after me. Oh, what's... Oh, 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 it's ghouls and ghosts. You've got to love ghosts and goblins, ghouls and ghosts, or whatever series decides to call itself. But the epic love story of the Gallant Knight Sir Arthur rescuing his girlfriend after she is kidnapped from their picnic he took her on in the middle of the night, in a graveyard and in his underwear, has endured gamers for decades. And any video game that uses more frames of animation to show off the main character's ass than any other movement is always an instant classic. Anyhow. Our good friends at Codemasters, not satisfied with a ton of lawsuits that are being handed by Nintendo on an almost weekly basis because of their game genie and non-official NES games, decided to get on Capcom's Wick 2 with their Commodore Amiga title, The Sword and the Rose, complete with Mega Man-esque stupid box art involving a knight wearing cyborg-like armour and shooting lasers out of his eyes. Now don't let the pretentious name throw you off. The Sword and the Rose is an out-and-out -out clone of Ghouls and Ghosts. Well, it had to be. The original title, when it first came out on the Commodore 64 previously, was Prince Clumsy. And since no one bought a game with such a stupid name, they decided to go for something a little bit more presumptuous. But is it a good clone, I hear you ask? Come on, you've known me long enough to know I'm not going to get three minutes of entertainment out of one that is, am I? Well, after two minutes of unskippable adverts for other Codemasters games, nice foreshadowing of DVD movies there, guys. The first thing that you'll notice are the enemies. Aside from the now rather cliched criticisms of using generic Halloween monsters as your nemeses, have a really annoying knack of spawning where you're standing, or where you're going to be. And on top of that, respawn in exactly the same spot as where you killed them a nanosecond earlier, making attacking them a dangerous and ultimately fruitless task. In fact, it's easier just to leg it past them 99% of the time. Also, the fact that the vampires sound mildly retarded, I'd love to say blood every five seconds, is definitely not irritating after a millionth time. Shut up! Also, if you are going to rip off a well known franchise, at least put some effort into it. Granted that the Amiga version of Ghouls and Ghosts isn't exactly the greatest port in the world, as you can see here. In fact, you'd be forgiven into thinking that the Sword and the Rose is actually the better looking of the two from static screenshots. But what I'm really getting at here is, at least that version could scroll. Why complain about scrolling? Well this simple plight of what basically amounts to pure lazy programming is going to give you all manner of headaches. From moving to the next screen, only to notice there's an enemy already standing there, well there's no platform there at all! teeth grindingly frustrating screen-to-screen -screen platform leaps, especially parts where you need to jump into the screen above you. I mean, look how long it took me just to jump to the platform above here. T 
to this totally inexcusable leap of faith jump across three screens just to get to the final part of the game. I mean, how the hell are you supposed to know to go there? And for the absolute icing on the cake, and I've really saved the best till last, remember in Ghouls and Ghosts, you spend hours slogging through the game only to reach the end and be given the ultimate FU. You have to beat it all over again. Well, don't worry about that in the Sword and the Rose. You could beat the entire game in less than six minutes. Seriously, I was amazed when recording footage for this game. What I assumed to be just the end of the first level is actually the entire game. No looping, no harder game plus mode. It ended for me in exactly five minutes and 19 seconds. Hell, the song on the title screen lasts longer than this entire bloody game. And to prove it, I'm going to show you in the licked video me playing it from start to finish. Admittedly, I'm no Skip Rogers, but if I can beat a game in less than five and a half minutes, then the ten quid asking price for this turd is a little bit excessive. And if you haven't noticed by now, they've not only ripped off Ghouls and Ghosts, but the sound effects are direct rips of audio from Streets of Rage. <sighs> We're off to a great start this All Hallows Eve, aren't we? I've been told that Super Nintendo copies of the Adams Family make great makeshift crucifixes. So it's good news that nothing has ever ripped that off, isn't it? Isn't it? Aside from being responsible for millions of children developing arthritis trying to emulate the theme song, the Adams Family is also known for their resurgence in the early 90s. During that time, they spawned three movies, countless video games, the highest grossing pinball machine of all time, and even an animated series. But their blue collar brethren, the Monsters, didn't really get anywhere near as much of a look in. There was two fairly unsuccessful TV movies, and a Wayans Brothers movie that's been in development hell since 2004, but that's about as far as it went. In fact, it's only recently that they've had any sort of comeback with Mockingbird Lane. However, the Monsters always proved popular in the UK, having reruns on the BBC all throughout the 80s and 90s. So off the back of that popularity, us lucky Brits actually got a video game based on their exploits. It's a bloody awful video game, but it's a game nonetheless. Developed by Again Again, a subsidiary of Alternative Software, the company infamous for slapping out great TV shows and movies, and then turning them into terrible games, such as Kung Fu Ripoff, Big Trouble in Little China, and Count Duckula 2, quite possibly one of the worst TV licenses in history. The Monsters is sadly no exception, and one of its biggest complaints to begin with is how short the game is, to the point it even gives the Sword and the Rose a run for its money. And to prove my point, I'm going to show you the entire game from beginning to end. Level 1, which ironically is the best level in the entire game, has you playing as Lillian, who must hunt around the monster's surprisingly small house for a screw to resurrect Herman and a heart to resurrect Grandpa. Then after that, go look for their car keys. They've really captured the spirit of the show, haven't they? Level 2 sees you playing as Grandpa in quite possibly the most pointless level in video gaming history. You simply walk down a tunnel, which consists of only just five screens, from left to right. That's it! And to rub salt in the wound, the only possible cool thing in the game where you turn into a bat and fly around the house, the computer takes over that for the whole section! Level 3, you play as Herman in another incredibly short segment, where you need to pick up two hidden items, which is a piece of cake considering there's only four screens they could possibly be on, then go collect Eddie at the end of the fourth screen, who seems to be silently screaming at a rock! Level 4 is possibly the reason why levels 2 and 3 were so short, as all the memory went into this incredibly long and tedious shoot 'em up level. Well, this time, you play as the monster's pet dragon Spot, and have to attack the same witch and gargoyle over and over again for 10 minutes. And don't forget to watch out for the bats that poop werewolves. And the final level, you're back as Herman, who must open every single door in this mansion to rescue Marilyn. But open the wrong one, 
which you'll do over and over, and you're either confronted by clearly visible invisible men, okay, previously defecated werewolves, and pensioners that just want to fondle you. And just to make things even more tedious for you, you can't open another door until the enemy you've just killed's death animation is finished. And what is your reward for enduring this crap? Nothing. You just get a game over screen. Then it pulls back like a tease and gives you a static, and they all lived happily ever after screen. Well, it's nice to see someone did. I'll be having therapy to get this tripe out of my brain for years. But after seeing this monstrosity, excuse the pun, you can see why no one ever made a Monsters video game ever again. It's just bad in all aspects of the word. The publisher, again again, have somehow managed to do the impossible and make a game that's unbelievably short, yet incredibly repetitive all at the same time. It's a game that definitely deserves to be left in the drawer. Like the Monsters used to do their bloody kid. You know, the most annoying thing about living in London is all the bloody werewolves. So it's a good job that nothing's ever ripped them off, isn't it? Which is obviously the link to my next section. What do you do if you really, really want to make a video game based on your favourite horror movie, but just can't get the rights to it? Well, if you happen to work for Viz Design, you just think, screw it, and make it anyway. Released for the ZX Spectrum, Commodore 64, and Amstrad CPC, which I'm playing here, Werewolves of London is slightly influenced by an American werewolf in London. Did I say slightly? Sorry, I meant blatantly. Silly me. But obviously, having a simple story of being shouted at by Brian Glover in a pub, turning into a werewolf, having a rotting zombie as a best friend, then sleeping with Jenny Agatha, would be a little bit complex for an 8-bit game. It would also be a little bit too close to the bone. Excuse the pun. <laughs> so they came up with a rather um, different story. Did I say different? Sorry, I meant to say stupid. I'm not doing too well with words today, am I? You play the role of an unnamed lichen, who has had a curse placed upon him by a rich aristocratic family, so he'll turn into a werewolf every full moon, which happens every night in this game, and the only way to be rid of this curse is to slaughter each and every one of them. Why this family placed said curse on you is never actually explained. But all I can fathom is not only is this family a bunch of dicks for putting such a curse on you in the first place, they're also complete idiots for not realising that they'll be inevitably be murdered because it's the only way to lift the bloody thing. But it seems that being a moron is commonplace for the residents of London in this game. First of all, walking around the city as a werewolf, you'd expect people to be running away screaming. But no, the public couldn't seem to care less. Then again, if you were a werewolf that looked like an anorexic Harry Knowles with curvature of the spine, you wouldn't look too threatening either. It's even worse than a Spectrum port. You look like an eight-year-old furry fanfiction drawing. And there's me thinking the Twilight series couldn't make werewolves any less intimidating. So how do you track down these low-life yuppies who have destined you to a lifetime of being a permanent special guest at FurryCon? Simple. Each family member is an individual crucifix appear on your screen, indicating they're in the vicinity. And the closer you are to them, the quicker your Jesusometer will flash. Of course, when you're a human, you're about as much use as a chocolate teapot. So when you do actually find a member of this evil aristocracy in the daytime, you'll come across one of the game's time vampiric flaws. You've got to tell them, no pun intended, all day long as they wander around London aimlessly till nightfall like some kind of stalker. Not that they seem to mind the person they've laid a curse on following them round all day. Come on! What a terrible night to have a curse my ass. I want the bloody night to come! Finally! And <laughs> now you're dog meat! I'm going to eat you too, you nosy cow. Ooh, and my next intended victim is in the vicinity too. That's a bit of luck. Oh, great. I've spent so long wandering around this park getting ready to kill that guy, they've gone and locked the bloody gate on me. 
Of course, being a bloodthirsty creature of the night does give you some opposition, and in this game, it's the police who are your biggest hindrance. Fortunately for you, though, they're as stupid as they are tough. Despite the fact that Metropolitan Police officers in this game have total balls of steel, seemingly confident they can simply walk up to a seven-foot werewolf unarmed and place him in handcuffs, though it's also conveniently never mentioned why you can't simply bust out of said handcuffs, are they made of silver or something? The second you turn back into a human, they're more than happy to open your jail cell and let you wander around the streets again. Even if you turn into a human in front of them, they're seemingly pleased you won't be any more of a threat and let you go on your way. But plot and mechanics aside, the press at the time had mixed feelings towards Werewolves of London. Issue 4 of Ace Magazine criticised the game for not having a depth or interest to make the grade, then gave it the nonsensical score of 573 out of 1000. Games Machine were more praising towards it, giving the game 75%, stating, There's something very pleasing about running around, eating passers-by and dodging the bobbies. Whereas issue 75 of Computer and Video Games gave it quite possibly the most crap review I've ever read in my entire life, simply copying what the instruction manual says about the title, giving absolutely no personal opinion on the game whatsoever, then awarding it the ultra-safe score of 7 out of 10. On a personal level, sure you can argue that you're practically useless for 50% of the game as a human, the map is somewhat confusing because a lot of it looks exactly the same, and the game of hide and seek does draw the game out unnecessarily, but for an 80s home computer game it's aged fantastically and is still great fun to play. I loved this game as a kid, and I still love it today. And hey, you get to play as a werewolf, which was and still is an original concept. I mean, what other games can you think of where you play as a werewolf? Altered Beast? Bloody Roar? Rampage? Hmm. That's nothing we scared off all along. Well, that's all for this year's Games Yanks Can't Wank Halloween special. I've been Gorilla Larry, and I'll be seeing you next year, unless I'm conveniently murdered in the next three and a half seconds. <gasps> no! No! And if you're wondering if I'm going to feature Freddy Krueger live in this year's Halloween special, the answer's no. I still can't be asked. <laughs>